All right, here we go. So welcome to the Sunrise Lightning Talks as a part of Open Data Week 2021. Um, for those of you who joined just a few minutes ago, my name is Adrian Schmoker. I'm the former Deputy Chief Analytics Officer for the New York City Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Really awesome team, many of whom are on this call and are fantastic organizers of Open Data Week, along with the fantastic Beta NYC team as well. And for the full list of Open Data Week events, you can check them out at open-data.nyc. All right, so our fantastic presenters this morning, starting out with Jack Lindsay, who works in data at um, a safe graph. It's going to be presenting about place key. Um, I think also like powered by safe graph in many ways, he'll be able to uh, provide uh, some clarity on the distinction there and share um, a really exciting demo. Um, that'll be followed by a presentation by Annabelle. Uh, Annabelle's with NYC Heritage. She's actually having a few technical issues this morning, um, somewhat similarly to, to me, which is why I'm not on my video at the moment. And she's put together a video. So I'll be um, facilitating the playing of that video for you all. That'll be followed by Salil's presentation of reading the news. And then last but not least, uh, Scott, the CEO of Rotify, uh, will be sharing um, his demo as well. And so with that, um, I'll go ahead and hand the controls over to Jack to take us through um, his demo for this morning. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for having us. I'm really excited to share some of this stuff with you guys. So I'm going to try to keep this short and quick and uh, jump through this in the interest of this being a lightning talk. But essentially, we're going to go through PlaceKey, and you can shout us out at PlaceKey.io or PlaceKey.io for the tag. Um, and we're going to be talking about how a universally unique identifier can create a more open data friendly world. And like most, um, I guess, companies, the, the solution started with the problem. And the problem was identifying multiple locations as people input different information. Because uh, whether you're a government organization or a private organization, you could be logging your data differently. And so a lot of times you see address data with like 123 Main Street versus 123 Main Street where we lost the capitalization and then we abbreviated street. And then we have building five, unit five, and B5. All three of these are different. And so you really have two options. You can write a really complicated script to run through this and try to uh, try to differentiate between these and, and write a program that understands that all three of these are the same place. Or you can use a universally unique identifier that gives it what we call a place key. And I'll go through what these numbers mean uh, in a second, but that's the gist. So... Uh, again, we're talking about the solution being place key. So the, the work process is you take your data, so either your private data or your public data or whatever it may be, hopefully data that's open to the public. Um, and then you run your, your addresses through the place key API and it will come back with a unique identifier. And you can take that identifier and merge multiple data sets together to then compare them, which then allows you to make um, basically open data is only as useful as it is comparative or comparable. So it's important to be able to take these multiple data sets and compare them. Um, here's the, the thought process behind the place key and how it works. Um, it is a what at where system. The where system is based on H3 hierarchical hex grid system, which if you're familiar with um, Uber data, this is where it's from. The H3 hexagons that get smaller and smaller for, for more um, unique or closer uh, address data that's mapped across the world. And then we have the what portion, which is an address encoding and a POI encoding. And so what's interesting about the way that this is set up as opposed to some of the other universally unique identifiers is that you can tell the relation between units based on their place key. And so let's say you have one building in New York and it has multiple subunits inside of it. That one building should all share the H3 as well as the address encoding. And then you'll have multiple different POI encodings for the subunits. So you're able to take a massive data set and compare them uh, differently based on your place keys. And you can tell the relationship between them. Now, I'll try to skip through this one. I know it's a lot of text, but basically uh, the way it works is it takes a search for a POI and an address with that name and does it case insensitively. Um, and then it goes through and does a latitude and longitude query that uses a fuzzy street address. If that doesn't work, it goes into a postal code and um, so on and so forth. Uh, and it just basically gets lighter and lighter with a little bit of uh, ML black magic put in there as well. So 
Um, the common use cases that we've seen for this recently are with PPP loan data, which was awesome, intergovernmental data exchange, uh, COVID hospital data. So taking um, this this data that you get from hospitals, which every hospital in the world logs their data differently for some reason. And you can take those addresses and you can merge them to something like uh, foot traffic data from SafeGraph, that's where SafeGraph comes in. And you're able to analyze all of these hospitals together instead of having to try to guess what everyone's meaning by their addresses that they're putting in. Um, and we've also seen it for COVID social uh, distancing versus retail finance to find out uh, which stores kind of have uh, foot traffic reduced because of um, or how much that's affect their finances and things like that. Okay. And uh, probably most importantly, there is a placekey.io community, and this is a community of data scientists and people that get together and talk about this kind of stuff and present their ideas. And you can also get support for it. Uh, and the most important part is it's completely free. The community's free, the product's free. Uh, and so that's where the big push for, for open data comes from. You can take whichever data you have, run it through this API and get this universally unique identifier and start using your... Um, using your data in a, in a more openly available way. You don't have to worry about um, really difficult citations or, or running into financial limits and things like that. And that covers place key. And I think there's gonna be a Q&A section later, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that you guys are welcome to ask as many questions as you have and I'd be happy to answer them. Fantastic. Thank you, Jack. And um, yes, I mentioned this in the chat, but if you do have questions, feel free to hold on to them for now or to place them in the Zoom group chat. And we'll be addressing questions once we've gotten through all four of our presenters. Um, awesome. Thanks again, Jack. That was really great. And sure. I'm going to dive into sharing my screen again in order to share... Annabelle's presentation with all of you. All right, similarly, could I get some confirmation that you guys are seeing my slides? <laughs> yeah, I can see your slides, yeah. All right, awesome, thank you. Um, so next up, we have Annabelle Alfres. She's with NYC Heritage, and um, we had a really fascinating conversation when all of us were, uh, all of the speakers were on a call just a few days ago. Annabelle is a tour guide for New York City, which I just think is incredibly exciting. I love taking tours of New York City. Has also been a Beta NYC member since 2009, participated in a number of big apps competitions. I was really excited to share this project as a part of Open Data Week this year. Um, the link to the actual project is on, um, is on this slide if you'd like to actually pull up the URL and tinker around with it. Um, and there's also um, her email address up here on the slide as well. She is joined uh, via audio and is going to do her best to participate in the Q&A at the end of the presentation today, um, but has really thoughtfully and um, uh, very kindly taken the time to put together a video kind of presenting um, NYC Heritage for her lightning talk. Travels through XYZ unearthing historic New York City's hidden metadata, an exploratory interactive time travel narrative. Good morning and welcome.
That was great. Um, I don't know if Annabelle was able to join us this morning, but um, thank you. Um, I think, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Do you want to say hello really quickly before we move on to the yes. next presentation? Oh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much, Aiden. I'm so sorry that it took so much trouble to launch that. It, it was a heavy file, and um, I hope it was worth the wait, or at least it introduced the project to everyone in a three-minute little video. So thanks again. And by the way, Jack, I loved your presentation, too. Looking forward to the next two. Awesome. Thank you, Annabelle. Um, next up is Celil, uh, who's currently a master's student at the New School and going to be sharing with us uh, reading the news. So um, this, just to give a bit of context before I get started, I am not a data person. I do not know how data works. Uh, this project was an inquiry into how I could use information that I had access to to form a better opinion of my own world. So this project started off, um, and this project is an inquiry into the news and I'm calling the calendar of conflict. And this started off because looking at the TV news in India, I realized that there's a very stunted sort of twisted view of what is actually happening on ground. I felt, um, and this is not, and this is primarily due to the fact that a lot of the TV news in India is controlled by the government. And so um, the perception of how the country is doing is twisted in many ways. And I also felt that um, I couldn't see the forest for the trees, if that makes sense. And to give another analogy, I'm sure you must have seen the Viewmaster, which is an amazing, this is probably the first VR headset of all time. But what is amazing about this is that I, I realized that I only saw each, um, you know, each piece of news as it was, and I never really got to see the news as a whole. And I, I couldn't form an opinion, what is actually happening um, you know, in a year, in a month, in a week, or what, how, or, you know, how the country is actually doing, or how the world is actually doing by simply looking at a day's worth of news. And so I started trying to figure out, can I actually put all this information together and see the news as a whole? So I created something called the Calendar of Conflict. And this is an interactive uh, web piece, which allows you to go month by month looking at all the conflicts that have happened throughout the year. And you can sort the conflicts of political conflict, environmental conflict, financial conflict, caste conflict even, and to sort of pick up on the points of the year where news articles talk about certain conflicts that have happened in the country. And um, this was amazing because I suddenly realized that I could take data and see it through a lens that I hadn't thought of before. And this allowed me to understand what was actually happening in my country better than I would have if I didn't you know, have data with me. And it works something like this. I'll post the link in chat later on so you can have a look for yourself. So each piece of news, so each line, uh, each horizontal line here is a day in a month. And each horizontal line is composed of very small, small vertical lines. And each of those vertical lines is one article. So in total, that's about 167,000 articles in a year, 14,000 a month, 460 articles a day. And that's been tagged with conflicts and you can sort of view them if you hover your mouse over them. And so I was curious about what this would look if I took uh, a New York lens to the same project. And so I went to nytimes.com got an API, this is super simple, and someone like me could quickly access the news. And this is what the data looks like. Then I take this data, put in an Excel sheet, and then I start tagging this data for certain kinds of conflict, right? So like financial scams or um, you know, any sort of environmental issue that have cropped up. And so this is the tagging of the data. And I've used the same lens I did on the Indian data, so maybe it's not the most accurate of looking at things. Um, and then I go to glitch.com, which is an openly and very easily uh, available website making tool that I recommend everyone to go use. And then that looks something like this. So for New York, uh, so on nytimes.com, there's about 450 articles a month that are related to New York itself. And that data has been sorted out with the same lens. And this is also openly available. You can have a look at it. All my code is you know, open source. You know, please go play around with it. 
But I think what's interesting about this project is that I was able to do this even though I didn't have any technical skills to do it with. And I felt that it was very empowering. Uh, you know, and I highly recommend that you to try to make sense of the world around you with openly available data. And there are a lot of data sources available. So, you know, this is something I highly recommend you do. And just to end, I don't think this project was a very accurate way of looking at the news, but it was an inquiry. And, you know, I urge you to think of, you know, what other filters can you use to see the world around you through? Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sulil. I really loved hearing about your your journey um, and some some really great quotes in there from introducing yourself as not a data person to then showing us uh, your code. So that's uh, it's really great to see that that journey that you took and appreciate you inspiring a bunch of other folks to dig in. Um, awesome. So it's my pleasure to introduce our next and uh, last Lightning Talk speaker, Scott Colbert, who is the CEO of Rotify, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about Rotify and providing a bit of a demo. So um, Scott, I'll let you take it away from here. You can go ahead and uh, share your screen. Great, thanks, uh, Adrian. I, um, I screwed up a little bit. I'm gonna run the two slides that I have from my desktop rather than the Google deck that you have. Uh, just because it might be a little bit easier. Does uh, no so everybody do that? Great. Uh, so uh, at, at Rotify, we are all about uh, organizing local content for display on public facing digital signage. Uh, we, we believe that signage is the most local form of mass media uh, because it's everywhere. And yet uh, it woefully lacks truly local content, despite the fact that there is a vast amount of really compelling and engaging local content available. And we've seen so many amazing examples of that uh, during the uh, various Open Data Week presentations this week. Uh, we also think that as live work play patterns become uh, more local and decentralized uh, in, in a post COVID world, uh, we think that local content that's driven by open data uh, and displayed in the public space can be an important force for promoting civic health uh, along with community and social resiliency. Uh, there's a vast body of information, <coughs> excuse me, available about what's going on nearby uh, that can be shared by everyone, even though the content in each location might be different. Uh, so our service provides a single point of access uh, to um, in, in, in two directions. Uh, it was a rather busy slide, but let me take you through it. Uh, we, we provide a single point of access for digital signage services and their end customers to this uh, wide array of location-based content. And we're also a single point of access um, for content providers, content producers, to a very fragmented world of, of digital signage. So you see on the left here, uh, there's, um, there's a lot of content uh, it comes from government sources, it comes from institutional and academic sources, uh, it comes from private sources, but it's siloed, it's all in different formats. Uh, so, so you've got siloed content on one side, <clears throat> and in the middle in this circle, uh, you have a very fragmented um, distribution and uh, exhibition ecosystem. So there's a huge disconnect between the silo and the screens that, are, that you see represented over here on the right. And that's where Rotify comes in. Uh, the problem that we're solving is this disconnect, and we're doing it in four ways. Uh, we're aggregating content from many different sources, which themselves have already aggregated content from many even more localized sources. We're provide, providing an easy tool for selecting the content that you might want to display on a screen, uh, another tool for deploying or for managing where those deployments happen, and, uh, and a display maker, so that if you actually want to create the end display that people will see, we provide the tools that allow you to do that. So what I'm going to do now is um, share, uh, hang on a second, while we go to what we call Rotify TV. And let me just make sure that I'm logged in. Okay, great. <clears throat> Excuse me, what I'm going to do here, uh, and I've set a lot of this up in advance to save time, but what we're going to do is uh, create two different displays, 
a COVID conditions and vaccinations uh, location display and a uh, display that shows local transit mobility information along with um, some local place content. Uh, so let's um, go here. Uh, again, I've set this up uh, uh, ahead of time. Um, but here's, uh, here's the way you create the display. You drop a pin at a location. I've chosen a location uh, in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And here's the various types of content that we have. Transit data, uh, dockless mobility in New York. Of course, we only have Revel. Uh, we have city bike information. We have civic data. And uh, we worked with the Food Policy Center at uh, Hunter College. Uh, Beta NYC was also part of that project to aggregate food pantry information. We have places data, uh, local storefront information from a local New York company called um, uh, Live XYZ. And uh, most recently, we've ag ag aggregated COVID-related data, COVID conditions data from um, COVID Act Now, which is a joint project uh, that the Harvard, Stanford, and Georgetown medical schools are involved in. And then also from um, uh, NYC Gov uh, vaccination locations. So we have all this data and you can see it here in either JSON format. Uh, here's the transit information. This is content that a developer would take and turn into a display. Uh, and I'll just show you a little bit of that. Uh, we'll kind of jump around here. Here's a uh, human readable form of uh, that same JSON uh, of all the local food pantry information in a radius around where I dropped that pin in Park Slope. And we have the same, same kind of information for um, you know, places. And uh, let's just uh, look here. Here's the, uh, vac here's the JSON for the vaccination information. We brought all of this into Rotify. And what we're going to do now is create a display. So let's start with the um, transit display. And uh, I've pre-populated this, but I left uh, one of these frames blank. Uh, again, I'm skipping over a lot of things here, but what we're going to do here is go and find the content that we selected before from that pin that we dropped. Here are all the different content categories. And what we wanna put up here is the transit information. We wanna put that in this frame up here. And so you see now here's a display that could be, um, that could be shown on a digital screen that shows um, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, labeling information and then transit, dockless mobility, city bike information, and all the uh, food stores and restaurants around that location. We've done the same thing uh, on the COVID display, and I'd like to show that to you now. And again, uh, this is pre-populated, and here I've done a little bit of uh, styling just, uh, just for fun because there's uh, some control that's possible there. And um, what we're gonna show here, what we're gonna add here is um, uh, vaccination location information that's coming from the city of New York. And so here are the places where you can get a vaccination in, uh, this is actually set at a 2,500 meter radius from the location where I dropped that pin. And then down here, uh, we're going to show the, um, Let's find the food pantry information that we selected and we'll insert that there. And here's the food pantry information that's coming from uh, um, uh, the Food Policy Center at uh, Hunter College. And so what you see on this screen is data that's coming from multiple sources. Over here on the left, uh, let's uh, just show you the preview. Over here on the left, we've got all this conditions information, COVID conditions information that's coming from COVID Act Now which has aggregated it from uh, local sources in every county in the country. We actually have this now available uh, for every single county in the US. So you drop a pin, the pin figures out where it is, which county it's in, and then retrieves that, uh, that local conditions data. And here you see it on the left. Uh, we have the places where you can get a vaccination in New York City that you see in this frame up in the upper right. And the, of course, the food pantry information over here. So that, is a very quick uh, snapshot of what we're doing and happy to answer more questions uh, about it uh, in the discussion session.
Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> really awesome to be able to actually go through the tool itself. Really appreciate you taking the time to do a live demo and just to see how much really valuable information you've been able to um, consolidate. Um, and that's able to be kind of um, adjusted, personalized, customized. So yeah, thank you so much for taking us through the tool. Sure. Um, all right, fantastic. Well, uh, from here, I think we have a little bit of time left uh, to be able to do a Q&A. So just as a reminder, we had Jack um, share Place Key, Annabelle, NYC Heritage, Salil reading the news, and Scott Rotify. Um, I actually have a question for Jack. I was curious if you could share a little bit about the intergovernmental data exchange use case that you presented that sounded um, super interesting as a former um, government employee. I was really curious to learn more about that. Sure. So um, there's a couple of use cases that have come out of the place key community, but a lot of the times what we see is we have a lot of like state level governments. For instance, if you have the EPD looking to work with the EPA, a lot of the data logged by the EPD has a different format or standard than the EPA. And so if those two entities wanted to compare their data, let's say the EPD needs to pull EPA data to, to like compare maybe how uh, Georgia if it's the EPD works with Alabama or something like that, um, they can do so by by merging those two addresses. So uh, applying a place key to them, and they can start comparing those data that data apples to apples. So um, there's not. I mean, normally you think of government data as being standardized, but anyone that's worked with uh, multiple government organizations, they know that it's definitely not standardized, and that's actually the entire reason we have. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, right? Because multiple organizations couldn't share their data. So. All right, thank you for that. And um, I see a question from uh, Oliver who's at the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. I'll read this out loud just for folks who might have trouble accessing the chat. Um, so this says, for Salil, <laughs> hi Oliver, um, I've thought a lot about how history will or won't be able to capture what it feels like to live through quickly moving news cycles and what people really thought was important at the time. I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on how quote unquote accurate of a time capsule you've created with your project and what other elements could be useful to add to that end? Yeah, that's a great question. And it is interesting how you frame it as a time capsule and how it captures this. It's like, almost like an, it's, it's like an ice core. You know, you're capturing all these layers or what happened in the news. I, I don't think this is very accurate, maybe because of the methods I've used. And I, I wanted to call out the conflicts in the news because I was concerned that a lot of people going off TV news media thought that the country was doing fine, everything's okay. And I felt that the skewing of perception was problematic. And I wanted to create something that could help me take my own, have my own perspective on what is happening. Uh, and so I think that's why, I think it's, it's an interesting inquiry. And I feel that it, it it got, it made me aware of what was actually happening in the news, but I feel like perhaps better filters or better ways to capture what is relevant from the data would be required to have a more accurate version of this project. All right. Thank you, Salil. Oliver, do you have any follow-up thoughts based on that response? Um, no, I'll just quickly say, like, I've, I've popped the project open and uh, really looking forward to playing around with it some more. Um, I think for someone who's not a data person, you've, you've put together something that's, um, yeah, really robust and, um, and interesting to look through. So thanks so much for presenting today. Definitely, plus one to that. And in the chat, I see Kate uh, put a question for Annabelle. Um, Annabelle, I'm curious what prompted you to create your project and if you could share one interesting data fact you've discovered about NYC history. All right. Uh, this is something I think I had brought up uh, with a few of you on how this project actually began a number of years ago. And it's a story I love telling. It was, uh, I think I was doing a, an educational tour for some young children who were visiting from England. It was a little school group, and there was one little girl, very precocious. At one point in the tour, we were in Lower Manhattan. Uh, she asked me 
a really cute question. It's a very simple question. Where's the center of New York City? And am I standing on it? I realized that this was a far more complex question because, number one, we were standing right on Wall Street facing George Washington statue at Federal Hall. I was aware that in the British educational system, they did not really talk much about the Revolutionary War. And I was also aware that within a five-block radius among where we were standing were some very, very foundational milestone events that happened. So I just tried to keep it simple. I didn't quite know how much you would understand if I started to bring up all these subjects of, you know, the Liberty Pole and everything else that happened, the culpering. So I basically said, no, you know, you are right. At one point in our history, this was the center of New York. But then again, I explained to her that I would love to write her because there were other centers in New York City. Uh, but it was when she said, why is this the center of New York, that I thought to myself, I'm going to give you a very good answer. And that's when I went home, Googled what is the center of New York, only to discover that Google gave me two different answers. The first answer was somewhere in Bushwick, Brooklyn. And another answer was a sidewalk on Queens Boulevard in Woodside, Queens. And that made me think, how did this data get up there? Who was putting up there? How was the measurement taken? What were the geo coordinates? And this had to do now with temporal. We were no longer talking X, Y. We were talking Z. The boundaries of New York had shifted over time. And that really changes a lot of things. Then, then there's, of course, the symbolic aspect of center for every single one. If you are a fashion designer, you would say the center is FIT. If you are in the cultural center, it would be probably Lincoln Center. But you know what I'm saying. So that is really how the project began. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, I love, uh, as a like person born and raised in New York, I love finding out interesting facts about New York City. And I will share, I visited the center, the center of New York in Queens um, once on a bike right. ride on my way back from an open data training. So uh, <laughs> discovering yeah. things along the way. <laughs> no, it is, it is just so much that has happened in this city. And one of the things I often think about, and as I'm listening, of course, to all the wonderful talks we've had here um, this morning, just the aggregation of data. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, if I were this advanced developer like Jack or Scott, what I could do with, well, first, much of data is not digitized for historical data. And just the steps that would be involved in getting historical data into even any kind of platform like Rotify, you know, or Playski, that will be, I think, years ahead. Um, because nothing, not all of it really has been verified or digitized yet, but it is taking place. Um, but yeah, uh, that's if where I'm I may, one day. If I may jump in, uh, just to yeah. echo what Annabelle said. Um, you know, organizing the data, of course, and um, sort of normalizing, um, you know, data schemas and data structures across all of these different sources is, of course, a big part of the issue. But there's, um, there's also a creative issue. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that is, you know, telling, figuring out the stories that can be told that are appropriate for a given use case. And so, you know, we look at uh, public facing digital signage and we say, all right, what's the use case for that? You know, you have to be able to tell a story in maybe under 20 seconds and probably in most ca many cases under 10 seconds. Um, and so what are the stories that can be told that are driven by all of this fantastic data? And that's a, it's, a, it's an imaginative process, it's a creative process, it's a design process. And, um, you know, the, the source material is there, but, you know, one of the big issues that we see is that there's been a kind of failure of imagination uh, around how to use open data to tell stories in the public space. Uh, but the content is there. I think, yeah. Oh, the content is there. And it's something that, uh, Scott, if I can just pitch in, if, if I may, just, just to address this. Uh, I see it with our link in New York City. Um, you know, the, the displays, 
you would have these wonderful photographs, of course, that are curated by a number of our museums. But I think to myself, there's you, you, with that huge space, the photo is taking up all of it. But you can do so much with that space um, in giving a story, a data visualization. Maybe not text, but a data viz. And right. I see it in my head. I do. Yeah. I do. It's just that I don't quite know how to write Google uh, sidewalks for this. But yes, if you really study that sidewalk lab, um, you know what I'm referring to. It's in New York City. Uh-huh. And they sometimes push the historical photos up there. I thought they're lacking so much in terms of what can be added there. You can dot the space. You can put a social network of the people who are around at the time. Um, and those are just three little, three little, uh, shall we say, three little nodes. Nodes is the wrong word, but you know what I'm getting at. It's a uh, huge, yeah. huge canvas, and there is so much more you can do with the right visualization. Uh, absolutely. And, and not only that, yeah. the audience is there. I, I mean, this is remarkable. Yeah. When you think about it from a media perspective. Um, you don't have to get people to tune in. You don't have to get people to click. You know, the audience is already there whether they're walking out of the lobby or in a store or walking down the street and they see it on, on some kind of kiosk, uh, the audience is there and they're there in huge numbers and, and it's global. So we mm-hmm. all collectively as a community, I think, have a great opportunity to really rethink how this particular medium and the use case uh, that it's associated with uh, can be used to you know, share content that can be shared by, experienced by everybody. That's pretty exciting. Yes, and I'm, I agree. I'm curious, uh, kind of building off of that, um, Scott, if you could share a little bit about what's next for Rotify and if you have any kind of call to action or call for collaboration with, um, with the project. Yeah, I, thank you for asking that question, Adrian. It's, a, it's, it's really very timely. What I just showed you with um, Rotify TV is um, and, and particularly the uh, display maker and some of the new content that we've added, the COVID data and the places data, that's all still in our staging environment. Uh, we're about to push that into production within the next few weeks. And it's really just a start. So the opportunities for collaboration are several. Uh, one is we're really looking for creative input um, from the open data community, from the signage community, uh, you know, from imaginative people that we don't know, many of whom may be on this call uh, or, uh, you know, in some of the other sessions, to really think about how public facing signage, wherever it is, not just the Link NYC kiosks, that's just one outlet, but, you know, there are screens everywhere. You know, walk around town, you're going to see screens all over the place and they're proliferating. How can those screens be used to? create a, a greater sense of place, a greater sense of community through the presentation of shared information that's localized. And from the, the, the sort of integration of information from different sources brought together in one place. Uh, is that a sort of static dashboard like what I showed you with, um, with the COVID data, which itself has content coming from uh, you know, many, many different sources? Or is it some kind of animation that can be created, you know, can you create 20 second stories that are purely visual because there's no audio, you know, so it sort of takes us back to the 1920s, you know, with visual storytelling, silent movies. Can you create Mm -hmm. visual animations uh, that share information with people about their communities? Uh, So we're we're absolutely very open to, um, you know, people reaching out to us with, with ideas about how that may be possible. The part of it that we've created is that we have relationships with a lot of the signage services companies. And we have a tool that now allow, makes it very easy to um, you know, select a location and then provide content that's related to that location. So we've sort of solved that distribution issue. But the creative part of it is, um, is wide open, I think. I would also wonder, um, just like from a devil's advocate side, um, I I love the idea, of course. Um, I just wonder what the concerns might be around sharing data um, in such a, like, if it's not like, uh, you know, if it's pulled from data sets that 
and it's not like given co- like the context or like if it could cause people to like uh i don't know it's like if uh, things could be shared in a way that people don't understand the truth of it or something i don't know what i'm getting I'm, or i don't know if you get what i'm getting at but um like how, what the procedure would be to make sure that what's shared is um is valid and um and is yeah i guess that's the point of data viz though is to be unbiased and share things in a way that people understand and has context so um yeah good data viz should be doing that all yeah that's a, also a great point but that's an editorial and a curative or a, a curational is that's the word you know uh, mm-hmm. process and decision i mean the data is there so you know well, it, it, but it's hidden when it, when you only see it on a you know like on a, on, a, on a website. When it's there in the open, it sort of amplifies you know, what what you're seeing. So those issues become more visible. But the, those issues are already there today. Yeah. Well, I suggest everybody to go check out the data through design exhibit, which is on through. Um, well, it's a, it's a virtual exhibit on the website DXD twenty twenty one or is that it DXD. Yeah, dfd2021.com. Um, and you can go check out some really great data visualizations using open data. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't know, there, there may have been a conversation about them being showed somewhere um, on screens. Uh, but I, won't, I don't know if that's true. But uh, go check it out um, and see what data. I, I enjoyed having conversations with folks about these pieces because um, it was kind of like a way to gently talk about uh different topics without you know criticizing things it was more of like an exploratory let's talk about the data and like the human factors of what this artist is expressing Um. yeah they're actually kate on screen at many of the link nyc kiosks throughout new york city um through the end of april so you could either visit the website or if you're strolling around um, many neighborhoods in the city you might see them there as well I had a question for Scott, if no one's got one. Um, so just because of the nature of the, the work that we're doing, I'm just curious, how are you, because you're taking in lots of different sources of data, right? So how are you, how do you compare those? What's your, what's your middle ground process before you get to the end where you're comparing them? Essentially, do you have a universal unique identifier? <laughs> well, I, you know, I was listening to your presentation, Jack, and thinking, how, how could that make sense in the context of what we're doing? You know, because I think it might be there. Um, all of the data sets that we're using, except for one, is um, it has a lat long associated with each piece of data. So we, we look at the lat long and we draw a radius around the lat, remember the pin that I dropped. So we say, all right, behind the scenes, you know, when, when Rotify TV is collecting that data, it's collecting whatever um, is within that radius. But the, um, the COVID Act Now data, the COVID conditions data is uh, coded, we're, we're using the county data set. There's a metro data set and there's a state level data set. We're using the county data set. And that has FIPS codes associated with it. There's a FIPS, which is a code for each county, five digit code associated with each county. Um, so what we're doing is we're using a, um, a lookup tool that the FCC actually has that allows you to convert a, um, a lat long to a FIPS code and then our system says, oh, okay, here's the FIPS code, you know, go and find that data, data. So if I drop that pin in Brooklyn, it finds the Kings County zip code. If I drop the pin in Montgomery County, Maryland, in Bethesda, Maryland, you know, it finds the Montgomery County FIPS code and then pulls that data. And that all happens behind the scenes. But you can imagine, and I'm sure that's exactly what led to your question, that there are data sets that are coded in many different ways. Um, Mapbox has an interesting tool. We haven't used it yet, but um, that has um, l- locations for um, or coded coded locations for I don't know six or seven different types of jurisdictions. Um, so you know this is something that as the diff- as as we begin to ingest different types of data sets, you know we're going to need to um, sort th- sort through that in order to know which data to pull based on the location that's set. Sure. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Reach out if you have any uh, questions about Yeah, that. I'd like to. Yeah. <laughs> Please.
All right. Well, if you do have more questions, I think you're more than welcome to drop them into the chat. Uh, we do also have a bit more time, uh, but I did want to take a moment just to thank everyone for uh, joining us. Um, I, as I mentioned to um, our presenters and Kate the other day, I am not a morning person as uh, my former colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics can attest to. Um, but I was really, really happy to be able to start my morning uh, with you all. Oh, we have another uh, great question. Um, uh, I'm not sure, Tom, is your question directed to all of the presenters? Let's see, Tom's writing, use Python to do this analysis. Any code to share? We're not doing analytics. We're really very focused on presenting the inter distribution and exhibition. Uh, specifically not on doing analytics, so. We have some Python notebooks and also a Python library. If you're interested in just kind of getting, getting your feet wet with Python, I can send some links in. Great. And Salil, Annabelle, I don't know if, if you want to um, mention anything. No, I... I know a little bit of Python, but nothing like what Jeff probably does or Scott does. Uh, but no, I, I don't have anything at the moment. Um, just uh, just listening to everyone and learning myself, just learning from everyone. And of course, thanking you and Kate, because this is tremendous work that you've put together. And I don't think any of us can thank you enough for it. Yeah, I completely agree with what Annabelle said. No idea what Python, not much, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Adrian, um, for uh, helping organize this um, and, or moderate it. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um